Hi everyone, welcome this afternoon. Good to see you here all uh, for the last lecture. Um, Jamie from Extra Moors will tell you more later on about what the last lecture is and why we are organizing this together. Um, my name is Annelie Koster, I am a program manager at Studium Generale. And at Studium Generale we organize events like this, uh, debates, uh, symposia, etc. And often together with study associations. We do that here in the, in, on the campus and in the city center. And well, you see the upcoming uh, program uh, behind me. And for Tilburg University students, it's good to know that if you visit five of our events, you can apply for our certificate. And that can be of interest. It is not a, a certificate where, which has uh, credits attached to it, but it's something that shows that you are you have done more than the average student, that you are a curious student who wants to broaden his or her horizon, things like that. And you get a, like a LinkedIn, um, how do you say that, vignette, what you can place on your website, um, on your LinkedIn site. Um, that's for the advertisement uh, part. I hope you have a, uh, a very pleasant afternoon and uh, Jamie will give a further introduction. Thank you, Annelika. Yes, so we're here today for the last lecture of Alkaline van Lenning and uh, Tessa Leese. Uh, and it is a very special last lecture uh, because for Alkaline van Lenning, uh, it is actually her last lecture. <laughs> uh, last week she stepped down as Dean of University College Tilburg um, and now Tessa will have uh, replaced her as Interim Dean. Um, so yes, a very exciting afternoon ahead. Um, the last lecture format was first coined by uh, Dr. Randy Pausch at Carnegie Mellon when he was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And he asked himself, what knowledge do I want to impart on the world before I go? Um, we asked a similar question to uh, Dr. Uh, Alkaline Lenning and uh, Dr. Tessa Leeson, uh, namely, if this was, for, was your last lecture, what would you want um, students, but also many colleagues, um, to know? What would you want to leave behind? Um, so. They answered with um, a, a very fascinating talk about resilience uh, and as far as resilience in students. Um, so yeah, without further ado, um, I will give the floor to Akeline and Tessa. A warm welcome to all of you to uh our last lecture that we will jointly teach. Um, Jamie has already introduced us. Maybe I can add that uh, I'm an associate professor, uh, an assistant professor, sorry, already thinking bigger of myself than I actually am. <laughs> <laughs> assistant professor at University College Tilburg, teaching history with uh, expertise in the field of Roman law and antiquity. And um, we have decided to team teach this last lecture because team teaching is very dear to us at our university college. It means that uh, we teach uh, a number of our courses with two professors in front of the classroom. Uh, and we will both bring in uh, our expertise. For Alkaline, that is social sciences. For me, it will be history. And uh, we will bring in our own viewpoints and engage in, a, in a, an academic and a respectful discussion. And the topic of our last lecture, the title of our last lecture is When Resilience Falls Short, Students at a Loss. And uh, resilience has been uh, an important topic for me personally. Together with Ellen, we have uh, designed a resilience project for our students in the bachelor program, Liberal Arts and Sciences. And so resilience has been part of our teaching activities and of our research activities at the University College. So that's why we decided to uh, teach on this particular topic. And uh, well, in the past few years, we have organized quite a few things at our college relating to resilience, trying to stimulate and enhance our students' resilience. Uh, Alan has taught a lot of workshops on the topics for our students. 
and there's a course in our curriculum on happiness and resilience. And uh, we've also uh, organized a few editions of a Failing Forward event through which we would like to uh, show our students that it is okay to fail. And for these types of events, uh, we invite staff members and teachers and students and alumni to share a failure uh, with the audience uh, so that we can try to break the taboo on uh, failure and uh, encourage students to be open about failures and not to feel ashamed because after all, well, we all fail sometimes and it's just part of the learning process and I think it is good to bring that message across to students. Now, uh, it is always difficult, I have to admit, and Anna knows, to find speakers for this uh, Failing Forward event, people willing to share a failure. And I have to admit, I have not yet been a speaker at any of the editions myself. So clearly I'm not very courageous in this uh, respect. But luckily, my colleague is, and uh, Alkaline was one of the speakers at the first edition of our Failing Forward event. And maybe Alkaline, you can share uh, the story that you've told there. Yeah, I told two versions of my resume, so to speak. And I like to share these two versions with you again. I have to tell you that uh, during the Failing Forward, the rector was there and I have to admit I was not too happy that he was there in the audience. I, I did not count him in, but okay. Um, let, I'll tell you my school history. At grammar school, I was an absolutely top student. I skipped a whole year. I went from the first class to the third class. And in the third class, I was by far still the best student in the class. So I answered all phone calls, I opened the door, and I made coffee and tea for teachers during my whole grammar school career. And I ended with the stop being the top stu student of the school. Then um, I did pre-university education. I never failed. I never failed one exam, ever. I went to the Free University in 1982. I embarked already, avant la lettre, on an interdisciplinary studies. I got a job offer at Tilburg University prior to finishing my master's. I graduated with honor. At Tilburg University, I became a coordinator in women's studies, later gender studies, but then it was still called women's studies. I did a PhD in Utrecht and I got the book published by a famous publisher. That is my resume, you would think. But I have a second story. This was all above the surface. Or oh, maybe I, w I was too quick. There, oh, there's more successes, <laughs> more successes. Uh, I became assistant professor, uh, I became director of a bachelor and a master, I forgot to put that down, <laughs> in uh, sociology. Uh, then I became associate professor and together with colleagues I designed a whole new program and I became the vice dean of then liberal arts and sciences. Then I became a professor of education in 2013 at the Tilburg School of Humanities and I became the Dean of the University College. I became full professor in 2018 and I still am professor of multidisciplinary education, in particular of liberal arts and sciences. People are always very much impressed if I tell them that. Okay, this was <laughs> above. Then what is below this service? Let's run my career once more. Grammar school. The quality of the school in this neighborhood was not very high. So I was a, a 
the one-eyed queen in the land of the blind. When I went to pre-university education, the first year I almost failed because I had no idea what it was to really learn, to concentrate. I never did that. Everything was shouted at us many times and I took it on, I don't know, but then I had to study. And we had this school reports and it was in words, so not in grades. And in Dutch, my report said, SOS, SOS, slecht, onvoldoende, slecht, slecht, onvoldoende, slecht. So that is weak, insufficient, weak, weak, insufficient, weak. That was my first school report. I almost had to leave that school. Then I did general uh, secondary education, HAVO, and only later I did what in Dutch is at the name and I was eligible for uh, university. It took, in those days it was not that strange, but it took me quite a long time to finish my study. If you look at it now, 1975 I started, 1982 I was done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it was normal, wasn't it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and then I studied andragologie. I can't translate it, but the study was stopped after, after I graduated. It was cancelled completely. So I always tell everybody I did some interdisciplinary studies because I don't think... It shows so well if you say andragologie. I started with a non-scientific position in Tilburg and I really had to work hard to get a scientific position. And then my PhD, the book was just in Dutch, never translated in any other la language. You could be more impressive in your, in your thesis. I became an assistant professor, but then women's studies got cancelled and I had to run somewhere to hang on to my job. And so I ran to the sociology department because I had to work somewhere. Oh, please, sorry, you're cl very close to that camera and now that can't focus, so I can... Yeah? yeah? yeah like, <laughs> so, so, so. Uh, then I became a professor of education, but what is that? professor of education. Nobody ever heard of that. And there was a debate going on here at the university and the rector told me, oh, I think you can't wear a gown and I also think you can't have PhDs. And then, okay, I got the salary. That's a big thing. <laughs> but that was all. If in, in, you know, if in, in a foreign country, if you say I'm a professor of education, no, nobody gets what you are. So then but that's rather late in my career, in 2018, I finally became a full professor. I tell you this because we always show what is on the surface, what is above the surface of the water. But there is so much under the surface going on. And we do not share this. I, I could also have shared my publications and then later how many times I did not publish and I could tell, I could share reports from reviews that, that, oh, this is not sufficient. And that happened. So I think in the end, and that is why I think it's appropriate to share this now once again, I sincerely believe and will come to that, that my successes or where I came is a product of a form of resilience. But we'll talk about that later. I think I'm done now, am I not? No, I have to go on. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have put resilience, this already told you, high on the agenda because we became worried about students. We experienced that students seem to have more and more pr problems these days. Especially when COVID, hello, when COVID-19 hit us, 
many students complained about feelings of loneliness, of, of anxiety, of not being able to cope. And the Central Bureau of Statistics did a research on mental health and well-being of the Dutch population. It's about the Dutch population. And they found out that a young generation, and that is the generation between 18 and 25, is the most unhappy group in our whole Dutch population. And what is more, they also found out that this group becomes more and more unhappy in the, over the recent years. Also, international data are in accordance with this Dutch finding that young people experience so many problems. And since we are educating this group, we feel we should talk about it, how to go about and what is our role in assisting this group, helping this group. Now we know that young people have to grow up in a very turbulent world and that circumstances are changing and that there are many problems that trickle down in your personal feelings in your personal well-being. I think resilience is very important, but what do we mean when we talk about resilience? Well, the term stems from the physical sciences and it has to do with the capacity of objects or materials to bend without breaking and after a certain moment of time to come back to the original condition. But resilience can also be used in relation to humans. Now, the American Asso Psychological Association says resilience is the process and outcome of successfully adapting to or challenging life experiences, especially to mental, emotional and behavioral flexibility and adjustments to external and internal demands. Well, it is a bit fancy and fat definition, but still now we have a kind of definition. Yeah, true. Uh, I agree. It's quite a mouthful, right, this definition. And um, there are also different uh, opinions or diff different definitions that are being mentioned in the literature. And Fletcher and Sartre have examined all these definitions. That's not very exciting, I think. But they, they suggest uh, or they come to the conclusion that there are two core concepts, two core features, key features that every definition shares uh, when we talk about resilience. Uh, first of all, that is adversity. So you can only be resilient after a setback, after an adversity. And of course, an adversity that can be uh, a minor setback, the daily hassles that we experience, but it can also be about very traumatic, major, big life events uh, that go wrong. So it's a very broad concept. Uh, the second key feature that they found is positive adaptation. And we also see that in the definition of the American Association, they call it successfully adapting. But what is it? When are you positively and successfully adapting? And uh, this is what Fletcher and Saka say. That is when you can proceed with your lives with minimal or no apparent disruptions in your daily functioning. So when we as colleagues, we go, can just go to work, no matter what adversity we have been confronted with, students can go to school, we can continue with our lives with no apparent disruptions. So as long as the others don't see that we're disrupted, then it is fine, then you are resilient. And later on in our discussion, I will try to be critical for this definition. Because Sartre and Fletcher say, it's one thing to be resilient, but recovery is something else. When you've malfunctioned and then pick yourself up again, that's not resilience, that's recovery. And I disagree with that very strict definition and that clear separation between the two. I think 
that also someone who's malfunctioned but then fix him or herself up again uh, should be qualified as resilient. Okay. In the field of psychology, there have been several tests designed to figure out whether persons are resilient or not. And the question very often is, why is this person resilient and why is that person not? But we also know from the field of psychology that you can be resilient in one respect, in one terrain of life and not so much in another. And this can differ per person. Also, you can be resilient in a certain period of your life, but not so much in another. And matters become even more complicated because resilient does not only refer to persons, but can also refer to groups, to communities, to societies even. Now, the topic of resilience is highly relevant in our contemporary society, given the adversities that we are confronted with today. I mentioned climate crisis, a war going on in Europe, uh, pandemic threats, just to name a few. These societal adversities trickle down in persons' lives and people feel that they weigh on them. Psychologists have discovered several coping mechanisms, positive co coping me mechanisms, as well as very destructive coping mechanisms that have often to do with avoidance, and positive coping mechanisms are far more often to pursue something. But what if all coping, coping mechanisms doesn't work? What if it falls short? What if you can't be resilient? In this last lecture, we will focus on the individual, not so much on society or groups, but the individual who fails to be resilient, who seems unable to successfully adapt as you should according to the definition that we just saw. When you can't pick yourself up after adversities, this might leave your network frustrated, feeling impotent because we can't lift you up. And in our day-to-day -day practice at the University College here in Tilburg, we come across students who set back interfere seriously with their schoolwork. As a result, sometimes students disengage. Of course, they ask for deadline extensions, they miss classes, sometimes they withdraw from courses, and ultimately, sometimes students drop out of the program. How to go about? That is the discussion that we will have later on. What is the most appropriate response that we can offer as an academic program when students disengage because they cannot be that resilient? But first, the floor to you. Yes. So uh, we will address this question. In order to address it, uh, we will travel back in time. I think uh, as a historian, I would like to do so. And we turn perhaps a bit unexpectedly to the first century Roman Republic and to Marcus Tullius Cicero. And uh, the reason uh, why we turn to Cicero uh, is because it's the last lecture and I have a, a bit of a thing with Cicero. Uh, well, I, I very much am very interested in that specific period in time, the Roman Republic. And uh, uh, Cicero, he was a statesman in that period. He was a politician, he was consul, and he was also an orator, an advocate. Uh, he had these great rhetorical skills. So he delivered political speeches and also judicial speeches. 
and he wrote a couple of books on argumentation and rhetorical skills and also legal argumentation. And for my PhD, I've looked into those rhetorical books and they really helped me have a proper understanding or a better understanding of Roman law. So that's uh, the reason uh, why I like Cicero so much. Uh, now, Cicero wasn't only a statesman and he wasn't only an orator and an advocate. He was also a philosopher, and I'm less acquainted with his philosophical works. Um, and he, he, he was also a father. He had two children. He had a son, and we don't talk about his son. Uh, <laughs> but he also had a daughter, and we will talk about her. Her name is Tulia, and uh, he called her Tuliola with a nickname because we know from the sources that he was really fond of her, that they had a very close relationship. And in the middle of February, 45 BC, uh, misfortune struck and hit Cicero because his daughter died. She passed away. Uh, she gave birth to his grandchild, and it's from complications that she died. And what we see is that this great orator and this great statesman was completely uh, overrun by emotions. He was devastated. He was completely at a loss. And what he did was he decided to leave Rome, to drop all his public tasks and his public responsibilities. So uh, clearly he wasn't very resilient uh, according to the definition of lecture and sarcasm, but he, because he didn't proceed with his life. He, he went to live in one of his villas near the coast, West Italy. Um, now, despite the fact that he physically withdrew from Rome, he did not completely disconnect because he had colleagues and friends sending him letters of condolence. And he responded to these letters. And it's these letters that have been preserved for us that we can still read and that we have still access to. And I really like these letters for several reasons. And one of them is uh, that they give us access, direct access, to, to the emotions of Cicero, because it's Cicero writing these letters, and they give us direct access to uh, what he is feeling in the weeks after the death of his daughter. And I would like to read a short fragment of one of the letters that he wrote on the 9th of March, only a few weeks after his daughter had passed away. In this solitude, I don't speak to a soul. In the morning, I hide myself in a dense and wild wood, and I don't come out till the evening. After you, I have not a greater friend than solitude. All my conversation is with books, though tears interrupted. I fight against them as much as I can, but as yet, I'm not equal to the struggle. Um, clearly, Cicero uh, was hurt. Uh, he was very emotional, open about crying, and I think that's very special and peculiar in the Roman Republic because it was not very accepted at the time. Um, and I think when we talk about emotions, an emotion such as grief, um, this is understood to be universal, right? No matter where you live or when you live, Everyone recognizes the emotion of grief, but the way we cope with grief and the way we deal with grief, uh, that is very culturally embedded. It depends on your context, the social context, the cultural context, the intellectual context. And uh, the letters of Cicero also offer us a glimpse and a sense of what the Roman elite thought was appropriate when dealing with grief. Um, and that is, of course, the educated elite, right? The intelligent Roman elite uh, giving us a sense of what they thought, this is how you should be dealing with grief. And uh, many of these uh, writers of these friends of Cicero were influenced by the Stoa. And uh, the general idea that comes across when you read these letters is that there was sympathy for the one grieving acceptance that there is grief when someone dies, luckily. Um, but there was, they were also quite strict in a sense that you could grieve, but not too long and not too excessively, right? 
So there is also the idea that you would have to rationalize your emotions and moderate them and master them and not to give too much oxygen also to your grief. And so try to moderate it. And um, I have another uh, fragment from a letter uh, to illustrate this, uh, well, expectation of dealing with grief in Roman times. And it's a letter written by Cicero himself. And the exact date is not known, but it was before his own daughter had died. So he was giving advice to his friend Titius, who had lost two children. And he was giving advice on how Titius could deal with his grief and what he should do. And he was paying uh, his sympathy for, for Titius. But he says, by recalling to mind what has befallen others, we should induce the reflection that was what has happened to ourselves is nothing new. So Cicero is saying, Look, tragedy, loss, death, it is part of life, implying others have survived it. Find courage in that thought so you can do it too. Now that's a bit the, the message that Cicero sends across to Titius. And again, if there never was a woman when bereft of her children so feeble in character as not sooner or later to make an end of her mourning, surely we men ought to anticipate by our wisdom what the passage of days is sure to bring us and not to wait for time for the remedy which reason enables us to apply at this very moment. Um, so what he is saying here is, that time will eventually heal the wound. Even for women, <laughs> time will heal the wound. So why would we wait for time to heal the wound if we can use our reason, our ratio, to do it ourselves and to search for immediate relief? That's his advice. And uh, then it becomes clear that when his own daughter passed away, he was unable to put it in practice. Uh, it was harder than he had expected, and uh, it's also a bit of an overestimation, probably, of the power of reason and of ratio, and also gives us a sense of how these Roman men thought about women as emotional to emotional beings, and I'm sure that Alkaline, uh, with her expertise in gender, has something to say about that. Well. You know, the image of being calm, cool, and collected, especially for men, is known across many cultures. It was not only for, for the Roman elite the case. And of course, it's a misunderstanding that displaying emotions is a form of weakness. So for many ages, this has been a dominant ideal, especially for boys and men. And that ideal also came back in the way um, young boys were brought up. Even, it is a hundred years ago, almost a hundred years ago, John Watson, he published a book in 1928. It was called The Psychological Care of Infant and Child. In this book, he describes how to raise a child who finally enters manhood, so bulwarked, so toughened up, with stable work and emotional habits that no adversity can quite overwhelm him. So this ideal of being strong, even 2000 years after Cicero's letter, still held. Now, in spite of his Watson's gender-neutral term of the guide, it was, of course, about boys only. Since then, a lot changed. The thinking about gender changed, and I applaud this wholeheartedly, because I think it is better for women and for men if we let go of ideals such as we heard. So the idea on parenting also changed, especially the last 50 years on gender, I'd say the last 30 years really on gender, which I applaud. 
but also the topic of how to become resilient changed. The idea changed and I'm more hesitant about that because I think sometimes in our daily life we are confronted with the results of those changed ideas in parenting and I'll come back to that. We would like to go back to Cicero once more for the final uh, excerpts because Cicero who was giving his emotions free reign and who was crying and who was uh, clearly devastated by the loss of his daughter, uh, received many letters of condolence. But after a while, uh, his friends started to lose patience with him and with the fact that he was not alone, that he was not taking up his public duties. And that becomes clear when we read uh, the letter of Lucius Lucaeus, which he wrote to Cicero. And he wrote it not even three months after his daughter died. And this is what he says. I was surprised at your never having been in Rome after I had left. And I'm still surprised at it. If you have abandoned yourself to tears and dejection, I grieve, of course, because you grieve and are so distressed. But if you allow me to say quite frankly what I feel, I cannot but blame you. Come on now. Well, if I can do no good but trying to persuade you, you should come back to live with us. In other words, resume your normal habits of life. Uh, so luckily, he says, I feel for you. I can see that you're grieving, that you're distressed, and I feel for you. But he's also encouraging Cicero and not very patient with him, urging him to come back to Rome and to take upon, again, his responsibilities. And I think from a contemporary modern day perspective, I wouldn't dare to write such a letter to any of my friends who has lost a child only after three months, right? So, so we were a bit uh, surprised uh, by the, the tone of the letter and the audacity that uh, Cicero's friend has to call him to task soon after his uh, daughter has passed away, quite soon, we think. But on the other hand, it might have been also the nuts in the right direction that Cicero needed. Um, so what is, what is appropriate behavior when you're dealing with grief and when you're lost and when you don't do your responsibilities anymore? Um, irrespective of the letters, we see that Cicero does manage to pick himself up again. Uh, he wrote a consolation to himself. He also would, in summer, 45 BC, wrote a philosophical treatise on the topic of grief, uh, come back to Rome, etc., etc. Uh, but two years later, 43 BC, Cicero would nonetheless be killed, murdered uh, by his political rival, Mark Antony. So a sad story after all. Um, and I think we will use Cicero in this last lecture uh, to reflect on the appropriateness of the response of someone like Lucius Lucaeus. What is appropriate when someone is uh, not being resilient, is not taking on the responsibilities that they have? And we will apply this idea to our students. How to go about when our students are not resilient, when they do not come to class, when they do not complete their assignments in, task, in time? Should we be strict? and try to toughen them up a bit. And that is what Algaline <laughs> will defend and plead for. Or should we be mild, understanding and compassionate? And that will be, that will be me uh, taking this, uh, pleading this case. Okay. Uh, before you start to think I'm a really cruel person, <laughs> I'd like to say there is an important difference to, between the major life adversities such as Cicero experienced losing a child, I mean, it leaves you wordless. It, you, I can't imagine that you, maybe after three years, but even then, write such a letter. So, and of course, students at this university, not only in our college, but at this university, 
sometimes they experience major terrible adversities and we have protocols for that and we try to deal with that and I think those are in place. But our differences start when the adversities are minor, minor life stressors. So I think ac academic stress, fear of exams, financial concerns sometimes, social stress, time management concerns, that's the kind of problems I want to talk about. In those cases, the responsibility of the university is less clear. And Tessa and I, we have more discussion how to go about. Now, my first argument is that we are confronted with concept creep. And I'll tell you what this is. In our daily dealing with students, an important problem is that often all kinds of mental issues are not clear. Or, even worse, the mental issue itself can be very debatable. In 2016, a psychology professor, Nick Haslam, introduced the term concept creep. He argues that the meaning of uh, psychological concepts, such as trauma or mental disorder, he names more, but let's take trauma or mental disorder, there's a kind of inflation going on. So the definition of some forms of deviance has enlarged and normality has, has contracted. So the other side has expanded and normality has contracted. And of course, psychology has played a role in this, Aslam says. But he also said, and this is important to me, although conceptual changes are inevitable, and often they are well motivated, concept creep runs the risk of pathologizing everyday experience and encouraging a sense of virtuous, but impotent victim mood. That is a risk Haslam sees. Haslam refused the changes in different concepts. I already mentioned trauma and mental, mental all kinds of mental disorders. Trauma, he says, first was something of the body only. The body, the skin had to be pierced to get a trauma. It was a concept for surgeons. Then it became a mental illness. But guess what? That expanded. First, it was only when you experienced something terrible, terrible, that is so hard to get out of your head. But now people speak of trauma easily. And this has different problems. It has also, it holds also the problem for people who have experienced a real trauma because others go oh yeah I'm traumatized too it was terrible etc etc and that is Heslem's worry so the concept creep the British teacher and journalist Lucy Galloway stated and I quote I feel there are two issues that have gotten terribly tangled up there are students who are mentally ill and who need help I mentioned already that group. And there are students who are having a rotten time, are not coping well, and who have diagnosed themselves as being unwell. This kind of self-diagnosis is making students more anxious and unhappy than they already are. End of quote. Callaway. I read the other day that the Central Bureau of Statistics stated that they stop working with the, the label burnout because everybody uses it so often, especially, I think this is not for students, but for us colleagues, we use it 
all the time. And we all almost think it's like having a cold. No, he has a burnout. Yeah, I had a burnout. I, I was uh, uh, doing a reaccreditation of global studies in Maastricht. And they had a group of 10 people. Seven had a burnout. And they thought this, this was business as usual. Well, they were overburdened with work. But the label was used. Far too easily, I think. So that is the concept creep and the self-diagnosis. We have concept creep, self-diagnosis, Callaway. So I think it is important to have a clear distinction, first, between major life adversities and minor stresses. Cicero, major, but I talk about minor and also about the diagnosis. What is going on? I leave the floor to you. Yeah, Alkaline, um, I agree that there is a difference between minor setbacks, the daily life stressors that we all experience, including students, and those major life adversities, uh, that we have to make a distinction between the two. And of course, we also adjust our response to that and the way we offer support to our students. Uh, if a student is stressed for an exam, we will respond very differently, of course, than when a student has lost a parent or has lost someone dear. So I completely agree that we adjust our response to the, the degree of the adversity. But I also think that the degree to which an adversity really interferes with a student's life and topples a person's life does not only depend on the severity of the adversity, uh, but it also depends on the person who is experiencing it. There is a subjective component to it. Um, and I think we all know persons who swiftly adjust to uh, the most terrible setbacks. People who are very resilient. And there are others who, uh, barely overcome the slightest setback. And we see that also in our students. Uh, even minor setbacks can put our students on balance. And I think uh, we should take these students and their concerns seriously as well. Um, and I do think that even though uh, we assess their setbacks as minor, that they deserve our attention as well. And um, I have two arguments to support so much mildness. Uh, and the first one is that I think that students are facing quite challenging circumstances. Now, research has been conducted, has been done. Oh. Yeah. I see Annelieke pointing out that my microphone. Yeah. Uh, so, well, research has, has demonstrated that this transition from secondary school to university, it is quite challenging for students, right? All of a sudden, students have to live independently and they have to make new friends and they have to um, meet our high academic standards. So I can imagine that that is uh, quite challenging, quite stressful, and that also this exciting experience of going to university can be challenging. And uh, the literature calls our students emerging adults. Uh, so they are not adolescents anymore, but not yet adults either. And uh, I think some of the skills that come in really handy to uh, manage these kinds of transitions, uh, such as self-discipline and time management and a sense of perspective, that students do not yet master these skills as perhaps someone who's a bit older can. So, so they might not have the tools that they need uh, to uh, deal with that transition uh, when going and coming to university. And a second reason why I plead to be mild and understanding for students who struggle is because our students, and we as well, live in a society that is meritocratic. And uh, if you look at the concept meritocracy, it comes from, well, etymologically, it means the rule of the merit, right? So everyone who is talented and who's intelligent, has the world at their feet, has all these opportunities, can make it happen also at university. And I think that's democratic. It's fantastic. 
but it's also terrifying, right? Because it leaves students with a, 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 a huge sense of responsibility. Uh, it's at the university that it should happen. That's the place where they're preparing for their future. That's the place where they are preparing for a job. And if we imply that we owe all our successes to ourselves, that also implies that when we fail, we have mainly ourselves to blame for. Uh, and I think that generates stress among students and uh, can make students vulnerable. Uh, so that is why I plead to be understanding if students struggle and uh, lack some resilience. Okay. Well, I think two counter arguments, maybe more, I don't know. I think two. Um, the first is that meritocracy has been in place for many years now. It's not something of the last 10 or 20 years. The, the term was coined, I believe, in the, in the 1950s, if I'm correct, maybe beginning 1960s, but no later. And I worked for over 40 years at this university. And I witnessed the rising number of mental issues in students especially the last five to maybe 10 years, these numbers really rose. The 40, 30, 20 years ago, that was not so much a problem. These students were also emerging adults. They also had to leave home. They also had to live for themselves, make new friends, and adapt to the academic life and rules. So something changed. And you speak about one person being more resilient than another, and that is a, could be a psychological view on it. But I like to have also a more sociological view. And then you see that the whole group is changing. In line with Noble and McGrath, they published their uh, piece in 2012. They said, parents of previous generation, and I quote, taught their children to expect that life could be difficult as it had been for them, for the parents. They modeled stoicism and taught their children the skills and attitudes that would help them to become independent and to be able to survive, end of quote, to survive in a harsh world that is sometimes unfair. My parents talked about putting iron in your soul. We have to put a bit iron in your soul. If not, you will not survive. Later generations of parents raised their children to display self-esteem and feel good at the expense of learning to become more resilient. As a result, and this is from an international study, young people are more confident, more assertive, but also more narcissistic and more isolated than young people were ever before. Another argument. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> if we do not allow students to fail, to be disappointed with themselves, to receive less than genuine praise, then they are deprived of the opportunity to develop frustration, and I think that is important in life, to become persistent, and who are motivated to work harder. I agree that the meritocratic society we live in is not safe, and especially not for emerging adults. But I also feel, I deeply feel, that it is important to perform under stress, to perform while you are nervous, maybe even anxious, to be there and to perform. That is, let's be honest, 
what we do. We have to. Students tend to shy away from the very sources that make them stress and that make them anxious. And they, say, they tell me, no, I'm afraid. Exams, you know, they make me so anxious. I think, do it. Try it. Maybe you fail. Second time, maybe you fail less. Maybe you succeed. I sincerely believe that we help students more if we are clear and strict than if we give in to all kinds of vague stories and excuses. If we do that, students will train the wrong skills, not concentrating on working hard, despite setbacks and small problems, but finding excuses and presenting themselves as persons who are entitled to exceptions. And I sometimes meet students and I think if you had put all the energy you put in complaints and emails and asking for exceptions, if you had put that into sit and learn, it was not necessary. So I'm so afraid that they develop the wrong skills because we are lenient. Yeah. Now you've made me anxious. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I agree that also for young people, of course, it is important to practice resilience. And we know that resilience is not static, right? It's something that can grow and that can develop and that can thrive. And uh, research has also shown that if you have been confronted with mild setbacks, and not big setbacks, but mild setbacks to a limited extent, that those people are indeed more resilient than others. So what doesn't kill you in moderation does make you stronger. So yes, of course, students should practice resilience and we shouldn't avoid disappointments or setbacks. But since it is so challenging to become resilient, I would say let's take our roles as part of their social support network seriously. Let's reach out and let's help students to become more resilient. And I have to admit that it's a bit of a struggle and a question how that help and assistance should look like in practice. And uh, Ellen and I, and, and particularly Ellen, uh, uh, has been teaching workshops on making students resilient and dealing with stress and students have applauded the initiative and then don't show up when the workshop is being taught so it's difficult what how, what do you what do what do you need what do students need and i'm curious to hear uh, from students in the discussion later on uh, what they would help what they would need and uh, a research has been conducted in the uk in a small group of students where they've asked students, what do you need to make that transition from secondary school to university more smoothly and to assist you? Uh, and they have asked for more information to deal with their anxiety and uncertainty. Uh, they have also asked, give us teachers the academic skills so that we can meet, meet those academic demands. And finally, they said, look, we would like the university to adopt a culture of inspiration rather than competition. So those might be starting points where we could help students become more resilient. Now, before I rest my case, I would like to make one final uh, remark. It's a more general remark uh, that I would like to make because when we read psychological research, we see that very often the goal is to make as many people as resilient as possible. And that resilience uh, focuses upon continuing to work, continuing to function. That's very important. But that very instrumentalist approach, which might be very typical for a contemporary society, doesn't leave much room for helplessness or vulnerability or despair. And I regret that because I think that the road to resilience isn't linear, isn't straightforward, but it bends and it curves, and I think that is okay. I think it is okay to sometimes drop a few balls, particularly for our students who have still, uh, are in their early years of, of emerging adulthood. Uh, uh, so, so I'm a bit, I don't want to, to promote this idea that we should all always carry on, 
always perform and always proceed and continue with their lives, particularly not if it concerns our young students. Okay, my final argument, and then Tessa will close this, this lecture. Maybe I don't look like it, but I promise you I can be patient with students. <laughs> if only I could feel they fight the right battle. And I often feel that they mistake the teacher or the grading system or the academic demands as their enemy. Now Nietzsche stated, you must always wane your campaign against yourself every day again. And I believe we all do, we all must. Students grow up and they live in a world that urges them to promote themselves. A surrounding that worships success, and I agree, that is the case. But it is exactly that ideology that prevents them, or at least doesn't encourage them, to humility and to honest self-confrontation. And I feel honest self-confrontation is a requirement for growth. We teach a couple of there are many teachers here in this, this lecture hall. We all know sometimes you teach a lecture and it was great and you go home and you think, I'm an excellent teacher, I knew it. I knew. And sometimes it was not so great. And you go home and you feel horrible. And then you have to sit down also as a teacher and think, what happened? And then you think, I didn't prepare well enough. The beginning was okay, but then the second half, I was not prepared and I lost it halfway and the student noticed. They, they do not notice what is happening, but they notice very well something is going wrong. That honest self-confrontation is for me personally so necessary, always have been, to grow as a teacher and to try and be the best teacher you could be. Seligman argued that if people believe that they are special and unique individuals and that they are entitled to happiness, they find it far more difficult to perceive themselves as a small, tiny element in a community of others who are just as complicated, who are just as important as they are. Nowadays, I feel an academic education has become an investment, an investment in yourself and an investment in your personal future. And that is not students' fault. It is, of course, our whole society. It is the way even universities advertise their programs. So it's not students' fault. It is the zeitgeist fault. But students live under that zeitgeist. And because they are so young, the zeitgeist tastes to you all like water. You, you can't taste anything. If you get older, you think, ooh, this is really different from half a century ago. But because students feel that this study is an investment in their personal future, they do not feel that they have a debt to society, that they have had this enormous privilege of that kind of education. They also think they pay for it, which is hilarious if you know what it costs and how much tax money goes into your study. It is enormous. And stu um, students tend to feel that they bought an education and they think, well, I like certain parts of it, certain parts I, did li I don't like. Did I pay for this? I don't think so, etc. And that is not their fault. That is how we all do, how we, how we advertise it. I think the individualistic ideology that young persons live in, and sometimes they 
embrace it, they also suffer under this idea of individuality. They think there is fierce competition amongst each other, so sometimes students are also afraid of the success of other students, which is terrible. I never was that. I never had to be afraid of that, because we were far more together and we were far more thinking... Now, I'll stop about that. <laughs> um, I see that students seem to suffer, but they suffer individually. They do not protest collectively. And that is something I regret. You do the end. Yeah. Um, our discussion continues. And uh, I would like to invite all of you to join uh, our discussion. And I would very much, or we would very much like to hear from you. And uh, despite our different angles, I think we do share a concern for our students. And we would wish to support them and guide them throughout their educational process and towards adulthood. But it is difficult to find a good balance between making students independent, encouraging them to be independent and at the same time supporting them. Uh, and it is also difficult to uh, see the university either as a safe structure and at the same time teach students what the real world is like. So please feel free uh, to share your viewpoints uh, and your opinions in, in, in the discussion to conclude this last lecture. <laughs>
<laughs> so that's what makes this thing so stressful. I think this part of experience or my observations are pretty much universal, even to like Dutch students, because I'm not Dutch student, mm -hmm. right? So I have my own problems that comes from my own culture, but I won't talk about that now. Mm -hmm. so, okay, okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Shall I start? You mentioned something that we did not mention, and that is uh, digitalization. That is uh, comparison uh, on uh, Instagram, what have you. I don't know where, where you're look, looking at. I always think, why are you looking all the time at these persons? You know, I, I never understand. But but that is maybe because I'm old. I never I never look at at lives of other persons on the internet. I don't care so much it doesn't interest me but it does interest younger persons so that is different yeah, and it's also part i think of the reality of young persons it's yeah. hard not to probably participate if everyone does that right so, so it's hard to escape yeah i think so too but then you know if already the question i have gaps in my resume does this affect my, my future possibilities is so much inspired by a meritocratic yeah. ideal and no criticism. On, I mean, what I would look for is that students can be more critical on this idea, can raise their voice against this idea. And you seem to go into it and then say, well, we suffer from it, but this is what we were told to do, as if you have not a mind of your own. You, do you understand what I'm, I'm saying? Yeah, I understand, but it's like you're raised up in this kind of environment. You absorb it like it is mm -hmm. an air or, or water. It's just everything normal. When you mention that we should just kind of protest against this kind of phenomenon, so what kind of way do you suggest that mm -hmm. we should take? Well. If this is something you would like to do, I think you would you should do this collectively and not. I always think why are people you know on the internet? Why do they post? Maybe they do also post for fun, terrible situations. But why not be critical about it? Do something different. Why not? Yeah. Um, during yeah. our as part of our resilience project, we have. Uh, taught some lectures and did some conferences also on the concept of success hmm. and how it might be helpful to uh, redefine success. success. Uh, because now indeed it is very often defined in terms of who's very rich or who has this very nice position at the yeah. university or somewhere else. Money status. Uh, but but yeah. success can also be different, different things. And maybe it's good if only for yourself to try to think this, for me, this means being successful. And it's, it should, doesn't necessarily have to be about money or status. It can also mm -hmm. be different things. Uh, mm -hmm. By growing, for example, that's what we try to promote yeah. in the university yeah. college, that students can grow and develop in the, uh, during their studies rather than have nines and tens all the time. Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think also like a really crucial part that we often forget is that when we talk about, oh, let's all speak together collectively, bring about societal change, where is it happening, right? We can have a demonstration right now, or maybe we can have a social media movement where we really, really encourage failure and resilience and how we must um, toughen up or whatever. However, when we look at these things, it's not a practical solution. The world is going to work the way it currently is designed to do so. The, the way society is moving will, and yes, of course, change is possible and you can achieve it, but it will uh, result through changes in law. Uh, societal beliefs, right? And the people who will be making these changes uh, have to enter the, well, political force or um, need to actively participate in it. And w when will that happen? It usually happens when there, when we see a giant need for it, right? And 
when we notice that, well, mental health issues are on a rise, um, certain, uh, let's say, social media habits or um, cultural normalizations occur. And all of us realize, well, this something needs to be done about it. Uh, we will be able to make the change, except it takes time for such realizations, for legislations to pass, for um, a society to change its beliefs. And so it's not a very short term solution of, oh, let's talk about it and like let's work against it. It is a much more longer term thing that needs to be inculcated in our everyday lives and that rhetoric and then will eventually lead to that. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's, you, you want to react to that, Ellen? Yeah. Um, what I miss a little bit in that story, although I think most of it is true, is yourself. Because you say it's society that needs to change, it's social media that needs to change, it's, it's legislation and it takes time, and I, and I agree with that. But I think the change starts within yourself, deciding that all these rules and all these ideas are not going to apply to yourself. And that's what then hopefully leads society to change. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I find it very hard, but I always try to change myself first and then hope that others will follow. And I missed that a little bit in the story that you're, that you're telling, although I think for the most part you're right. Yeah. Kate, you want to react to that? Uh, yeah. I, I well, see was, you. Were you quite, okay. I'd like to push back on that a little bit sure. um, because I think that the, the political economic situation that students are in now is very different compared to, for example, Alkaline, when you were had your experience, you know, Europe um, was, was, our societies were much more social democratic. You could go to university and leave university and probably get a job and buy a house and all of those things. Well, more than, not more so than students enough. can now. I think there's, there was much more, there was also more social mobility and things like that. But since then, neoliberal capitalism has meant that society is, um, is structured in a very different way and there is less kind of opportunity, especially for certain groups in society. Mm -hmm. yes. And so I do think that it, it starts with the individual, but I also think that our students are, are finding themselves in a very, very difficult situation right now um, and, and experiencing challenges that we as teachers, as slightly older teachers, maybe can't quite understand. Yeah, I, I agree that, that uh, especially, especially the effect of neoliberalism, and that's, that's a whole different long story, is, is in place. But, you know, uh, the, the things you said, that it will take long. I joined uh, the feminist movement uh, in the early 70s, and it was quite a struggle, let me tell you. And we demonstrated not once, not twice, not ten times, but hundreds of times. And in the end, we were in the media, we published books and legislation changed. And we were with a big, big group and the group was growing. I believe in that. And I lived in, in squatted houses for almost 20 years because it was not possible to rent, let alone buy a house in Amsterdam. I refuse to leave Amsterdam, so that's, <laughs> that's my loss. But yeah, okay. But still, you know, it was really difficult and we squatted houses and we forced the municipality to buy the house and to rent it for people who had modest means. And when I got this job at the university, I left the squatted house because I felt now I could rent and I should rent. So it wasn't only easy or very quick, quick win. That's not true either, although you are absolutely right about the effects of neoliberalism. There was a, a remark over there. Um, so maybe another part of it is that, especially if we have to group together and we have to start a movement, um, that also puts much more pressure on us that we should define our future. And we are still figuring out as students what <laughs> we should do with our lives. So it's hard to advocate for yourself and how the world should look like if you don't have a taste of 
how the world actually is. So that, that I think is a problem, but um, another thing is that we should have a unified theory on how this mm -hmm. should work in order to plead and in order to have a movement. And um, I don't know how things should look like or what needs to be done. So um, I don't know if students can actually make a change um, right away. All right. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to maybe go a bit away from what has been said so far and start by saying that one of my heroes, Martin Luther King, said that one should be an extremist for love. Mm -hmm. Another one of my heroes, uh, Venerable Fulton Sheen, said that on the pinnacle of suffering was also the pinnacle of love. Mm -hmm. And then another one of my heroes, Mary, also said, do as he says, and take this as a prelude for my comment and to keep in the back of your minds. Uh, so I want to, because as, as much as I thank you both for your uh, inputs, I see that, and as much as I feel inspired by them, I feel like it doesn't go far enough, uh, which is why I want to mention two figures that I think are very important and have been very important uh, in my life and especially when it comes to, to the topic of resilience, which is Mary and Jesus, and especially on the cross. So in, in, in the Catholic tradition, we always say that the cross is the greatest place of suffering. In the cross was Jesus and at the foot of the cross was Mary. But at the same time, we say that those two figures were the happiest they were in their lives during that precise moment, which is very odd to say because of the immense suffering that was going on. We also say, turning to Mary, that she was the greatest theologian of all theologians, because not only because of her joy at the foot of the cross, but also because she understood the mysteries of the works of God uh, as best as anyone ever did. So from that, I want to also turn to, to Jesus when he says, greater love has no one than he who lays down his life for his friends. And then you see the cross and you see that he abides by his word. This reminded me a lot of what, what you said, al clean regarding responsibility. Because we see this man who claims to be God and who claims to be, who, who makes lots of uh, preposterous claims, let's say, and goes through with them at the end. So he takes all the sin that there is in the world on his back, and then he dies for it on the cross in a majestic sort of way, but also a cruel sort of way. And somehow this gives rise to a resurrection. So this to me points out, this points to me that there, that the solution in this needs to be somewhere in love and not in mm -hmm. uh, sort of um, sort of uh, band-aid solutions mm -hmm. that do not do not encompass the whole of the um, of the human experience. Because okay, I, I stop you here if, if you uh, let me. I think um, what I can take from your from your um, from your input is that love is a very fundamental and important thing in life. And I think it is also within the university. We, you were brief about it, but you touched upon it at the end of, of our talk when you said that, of course, we want to help um, students. And that is, I think, if you do not love students in the right sense, of the world, you should not be working at a university. You should do something else. If you can't love students, you can't teach, or you're a horrible teacher. Uh, so, and it is uh, our discussion, uh, of course, we exaggerated a bit for debate's sake, but it stems from we love these young emergent adults, these young students, and how can we help them best? It is not uh, about uh, quick, fi quick wins or quick fixes. 
It is about what is the best guidance. And we have this difference in ideas about it, but mm -hmm. it stems from love and care. And I think that is very important. Let me just very quickly. I think um, there I've, drinks that we can discuss better. Yes, right? there are drinks, so feel free to raise the issue during drinks. I've uh, received a few signals already that we are running over time. Uh, so uh, I would like to thank all of you for your input in the discussion. Thank you very much. And there are drinks so you can ask additional questions or make additional comments during drinks. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.